welcome back. Here we are again, coming at you from West Virginia, as you can tell. <laughs> All right, so here's your joke of the day. How do you make seven an even number? Well, you take the S out. <laughs> good one, good one. Thank you, JD. Thank you, my son. You want to wave? No, I'm good. No. <laughs> Anyways, okay, here we are taking a look at quadratic equations again, and we now know what a quadratic equation is. Remember, it's got a second power on the x, or the y, but we're just looking at second power on an x in these cases. And we've looked at our four methods for solving quadratics. We looked at the method of factoring that, remember, said, if I have two things that are multiplied by zero, or not, let me rephrase that, two things multiplied together to get a zero, then one of these two things has got to be the zero. So you factor your equation until you get those two things that are multiplied together. Even if it's a parentheses times a parentheses, there's the two things that are multiplied to be a zero. Then one of these two has got to be the zero. We looked at the square root property. Square root property said if you do not have a first power term, all you've got to do is take the square root of both sides. Pretty straightforward. You need to isolate that squared term, get it completely by itself so that all that's sitting there is something squared, even if it's a parenthesis squared, because if it's a parenthesis squared, just take square root of both sides. Piece of cake. So we're going to look at the third method now, which is the method of completing the square. Now, honestly, the completing the square method is the hardest of all four methods. Um, so I'll walk through it kind of slowly. But a couple of years ago, I figured out that the method of completing the square is quite frankly based on this square root property. So if I can take my equation and I can make it look like that square root property, for instance, a parenthesis squared, then all I got to do is take the square root. Well, not all equations come at me as parenthesis squared. So what I have to do is I have to create the parenthesis squared. The process of creating the parenthesis squared is that process of completing the square. So what I want to do is I want to make a perfect square trinomial because if I have a perfect square trinomial, I can factor it so that it becomes parentheses squared. Now you may be saying, uh, perfect square trinomial? I don't even know what that is. So let me refresh your memory about what a perfect square trinomial is. This is a perfect square trinomial. It's called a perfect square trinomial for a couple of reasons. One. Trinomial means how many terms? Yep, three. And I've got one, two, three terms right here. Perfect square for a couple of reasons. One reason, I got a squared term right here, and I got a squared term right here. But more than that, if I take this perfect square trinomial and factor it, it will factor as a binomial squared. Binomial, remember, means having two terms. So in other words, it factors as parentheses squared. So let's take a look at this perfect square trinomial and let's factor it to show you what I'm talking about. Remember, I always, 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 always look first to see if there's something common that I can divide out of every single term before I do anything else. And as you look at these three terms, no, there's nothing common. Sure, I can take an x out of this one and this one, but I can't take an x out of here. I can take an h out of this one and this one, but I can't take an h out of this one. I have to be able to factor out of every single term in order to factor out that common monomial. It's not happening here. So when I can't do that, then I head on into that quantity squared. In other words, it, not quantity squared, I'm sorry, but into that double parentheses. So I'm headed into this double parentheses. And remember, the back sign here is going to tell me whether they're the same or opposites. This tells me they're the same. I look at the middle term to tell me whether they are both positive or both negative. In this case, they're both going to be positive. Now, to be quite frank with you, your perfect square trinomial could have a minus in here. But the idea is this is definitely going to be a plus, no doubt about it, because that will make these two be the same sign. So I could have both pluses. I could have both minuses. Now, remember, this factors into the front two slots, so it'll factor as an x and an x. This will factor into the back two slots, so it'll factor as an H and an H. Now remember, I can check this by FOIL, and remember, I'm not worried about the first and the last because I promise you multiply those are X squared. I promise you multiply these, they're H squared. It's the outsides and insides that I'm worried about. But when I go out here, I'm going to get an XH, and when I go in here, I'm going to get another XH, HX, HX, XH, it's all the same thing. And the idea is this, these two are like terms. 
So I have, if I have an HX and an HX, or an XH and an XH, I get a 2XH, which is exactly what I've got right there. So this is, in fact, the way to factor it. Remember, when we looked at the, um, factoring at the beginning of this unit, um, I said you've got to be very careful and keep your eyes open that when you see something times itself, how do you write it? Oh, absolutely. Yes, you're right. So I'm going to write it as quantity squared. And the reason I'm doing this is because when I have an equation, I will take this side of the equation, or maybe the other side, but I'll take one side of the equation that will look like this. I will factor it in this way. I'll get quantity squared. It will be set equal to something. This now starts looking like my square root property. And we know at this point all we got to do is take the square root of that side, and when squaring and square rooting cancel each other out, I've got what's inside here. We looked at that before. So this is what the method of completing the square is based on. I want to create this perfect square trinomial which will not always be sitting in front of me, I might have to create it. Now the method of creating it, like I said, is this method of completing the square. So let's take a look here. Um, I've got outlined for you the four steps, but I want to walk through this example so that when I put these four steps up here, it'll make a whole lot of sense to you. Otherwise it'll be pretty arbitrary and it won't make much sense. So I'm going to look at this, and remember, if I can factor this quadratic, that's the easiest way to do it. But this one won't factor because there's definitely nothing common that I can divide out of each and every term. So I'll try for that double parentheses. This will most certainly split up as an x and an x. And the idea is this, that 5, there's only one way to split up a 5. It's a 5 and a 1. That's all I've got. So I'll put a 5 here and a 1 here. This being a negative, remember, that means that these signs are going to be opposites. So I could make this the plus and this a minus. But when I check those outsides and insides out here, I get a negative x. In here, I get a positive 5x. That gives me a 4x, and that's not what I wanted. I wanted a 6x. The only thing that I could do here to fix anything at all would be either to switch the numbers or the signs. That's it, because switching these two doesn't help at all. And if I switch the signs and make this a negative and make this a positive, then I get a positive x and I get a negative 5x. That doesn't help because it makes it a negative 4x. So this will not factor. And remember, I can't use my square root property because I can only use the square root property when all i got to do is take square root. That's it. Or maybe, like, throw something to the other side and divide. In other words, this first power term right here is completely messing up my square root property. I can't get that 5 over there and then just take the square root. It's not happening. So this is why we have this method of completing the square. Now, what helps me tremendously, and I used to be one who was just a robot. I was very good at memorization and regurgitation. I could just memorize my steps and make sure I went down the line, but I'm not as good at memorizing as I used to be. So I try to cut back on the memorization, and I'm sure you don't want to memorize more than you have to memorize. So here's what hit me a couple of years ago about this method of completing the square, because I used to, like I said, memorize those steps. I used to teach it to my students. Memorize the steps and make sure you check off every single step. But a couple of years ago, it hit me that ultimately what I want to happen is I want this quantity squared so that all I have to do is take the square root of both sides. And then I said, well, wait a minute. In order to have a quantity squared, I have to have identical parentheses sitting here. If I have the same thing in both of these parentheses, I'm going to write it as quantity squared. And so I look at this up here and I say, well, could I factor that into identical parentheses? I just showed you, you definitely can't. So I look at this and I say, well, what's preventing me from factoring it into quantity squared, or into identical parentheses? It's this 5 right here. So if I could get rid of the 5, maybe I could force it to happen. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do in terms of my steps, is I'm going to isolate that constant term. And I'm going to get it completely by itself. So isolating that constant term, the constant is the one that doesn't have any variables with it. I'm going to isolate it, throw it to the other side. So to get rid of it, that means I'm going to add a 5 to both sides, and that will give me x squared plus 6x equal to 5. Now remember, ultimately what I want is I'm going to factor it like this so that I have the same thing in both parentheses. This, the only thing that I can do to factor it is I can take an x out of both sides, and I'll get an x plus 6. But that's not identical parentheses. It's not helping at all. 
So what I have to do is, like I said before, I have to create that perfect square trinomial. Now let me kick it back here and show you what that perfect square trinomial looked like one more time. Remember, it looks like this. So what I currently have is this part of it right here. I need to add in this right here so that I will force this. Now, in order to create that, in order to add that to both sides, I need to figure out what it is that I'm going to add here. Well, notice if I take this middle term and I take a look at just this piece right here, this 2h. In other words, the coefficient of my x to the first power. If I take this coefficient right here, this 2h, and I cut it in half, and those will cancel out, and then I square it, then I will get this h squared right here. So in other words, this method of completing the square, what's going to happen is, I am going to, hold on a second, very sorry about this. What's going to happen is, I'm going to add to both sides, a certain factor. And the factor that I'm going to add is going to be that I'm going to take half of the middle coefficient and I'm going to square that. Half of your middle coefficient, square it. You're going to add that to both sides. Now yes, I skipped over this second line, but we're going to fill that in in a minute. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my middle coefficient, this 6 right here, I'm going to cut it in half, and then I'm going to square that. And that's what I'm going to add right here, and I'm going to add it right here. Because what I do to one side, I have to do to the other side. That's just basic knowledge of equations. So when I take that 6 and cut it in half, I get 3. When I take that 3 and square it, I get 9. That's what I'm going to add over here. So I'm going to take my x squared plus 6x, I'm going to add a 9, and that means I'm going to add a 9 to the other side as well. The reason that I'm doing that is because now this will factor beautifully. Notice in this case that this tells me my signs are the same, this tells me they're both pluses, x squared splits up as an x and an x, I want two numbers that will multiply for 9 and add for 6. Well, that's easy. That's a 3 and a 3. 3 times 3 is 9. And when I check out here, I get a 3x. When I check in here, I get another 3x. 3x and 3x, sure enough, that's that 6x that I wanted. So that is the correct way to factor it. But notice, remember I told you guys when we factored, I said keep those eyes open. Very important that when you see something times itself, write it as quantity squared. Here's why. Because now I have this, and now I'm going, oh my gosh, it's the square root property. I know what to do at this point. I'm just going to take the square root of this side. Squaring and square rooting are going to cancel each other out. I've just got an x plus 3. I'm good to go because I'm just going to subtract a 3 from both sides. But remember, when I take the square root of this side, I also have to take the square root of this side. So I have to figure out what is sitting over here that I'm going to take the square root of. Remember, I added a 9 here, but i got to do it on the other side. The whole idea of an equation being a pan balance. i got to keep it balanced out on both sides. So when I added that 9 over here and then over here, 5 and 9 will give me a 14. So what I'm going to take the square root of on this side is going to be a 14. Now remember, this means I'm looking for a number that I can multiply by itself to create a 14, which I can't think of. I'm going to try to simplify this radical, but 14 is 7 times 2, and that does not help. Always simplify a radical if you can. Always look for those perfect squares and pairs underneath that radical. If you find a perfect square, take the square root out. If you find a pair, take one out, dissolve the other one. So simplify those radicals always. Also remember, now this one doesn't, but also remember that square root was not already on the page. I need to... I, I, I need to insert the plus minus because I took the square root. It wasn't already on the page. So I need a plus or minus square root of 14 there. But now remember, I don't want an x plus 3. I just want an x. That's all. So I'm going to subtract 3 from this side. I'm going to subtract 3 from this side. And what that will give me is x equals a negative 3 
plus or minus square root of 14. And that's my answer. So, with this method of completing the square, remember the steps are isolate that constant term, get it out of there, because it's what's not allowing you to create the same um, factors, or it's not allowing you to create a double parenthesis where they have identical terms in each, which will allow you to create a perfect square, or, or binomial squared. You want the binomial squared so that you can take the square root of both sides. The only way to get that binomial squared is to have identical parentheses. So you look at what you started with and you say, will this factor into identical parentheses? If not, get rid of won't, what won't let you. So you're going to isolate that constant term, get it out of there because it won't let you. And then you're going to add to both sides half of that middle coefficient squared because that will allow you to get that binomial squared. And once you get that binomial squared, you are simply going to take the square root of both sides because you're back to the square root property square root of both sides. So now let me get you to a second example um, because I've got three examples to show you and you know that they're going to get increasingly difficult but I want you guys to be able to see everything that you might run across so that nothing surprises you. So enjoy the scenery while I get this out of here. And um, Gosh, I sure wish this is what it was like in West Virginia right now. Definitely is not. We'll get some sun here pretty soon. It'll be all right. But here is my second example. I've got an x squared minus a 3x minus a 5 equal to 0. And like I said, the whole idea here, what helped me, oh my gosh, it saved my life a couple of years ago was realizing that ultimately what I want is this binomial squared. Now that I've realized that, this is what I do. When I solve a, a, a problem by completing the square, I do this. I go ahead and put my binomial squared at the bottom of the page, and then I start working myself backwards. And I go, okay, what would it take to have a binomial squared? Well, I would have to have identical parentheses. And then I say, okay, will this factor into identical parentheses? Definitely not. Now the x squared will split up as an x and an x, that works out just fine. But my problem is this will not split up identically. So I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to slide it to the other side. I'm going to isolate that constant term, get it out of there. So we all know that to get it out of there I'm going to add a 5 to both sides and that will give me x squared minus 3x equal to 5. Now when I look at this, I'm still, in the back of my head, I'm always going, will that split into identical parentheses? That's my goal because I want a quantity squared. This still will not factor into identical parentheses. I'm going to force it to happen by adding something over here. So I'm going to say I'm going to take this side and I'm going to add something in there that will force this to happen. And we know that because of this whole pan balance idea with equations, what I do on this side, i got to do on the other side. So I'm going to add it over here as well. To figure out what's going to go in here, I take this middle coefficient right here, I cut it in half, and I square it. Now this one's not as pretty, not as easy, because when I take that negative 3 and I cut it in half, it doesn't cut in half as nice. Before I had a, whoops, I had a 6. 6 cut in half is 3. That's easy. This doesn't cut in half so nicely. I don't want to deal with a negative 1.5. We don't even do decimals at this point if we can avoid them. We're just going to stay with fractions. We're okay with fractions. We've got this. We know how to do fractions. We're good. We've got this. So I'm going to take and cut in half, but I do need to simplify the fraction if I can. Negative 3 over 2 won't simplify, so I'm stuck as far as that goes. But I'm definitely going to square it. And you know how to square a fraction. We've looked at this before. Squaring means it times itself, but we know our laws of exponents. And remember, the laws of exponents also tell us we can distribute the power. It's back. It's totally back. Anyways, I'm going to square the numerator, square the denominator. I'm going to distribute that power to the numerator and to the denominator. When I do, negative 3 squared will be 9. 2 squared will be 4. That's what I'm going to add right here and right here. I'm going to take that 9 fourths and I'm going to add it in here. And we'll take that 9 fourths and I'm going to add it in there as well. Now, this looks scary to factor, but trust me, the fractions work themselves out. 
I already know this splits up as an x and an x. I already know this means same signs. This means both of them to be a negative. I just need to figure out what I'm going to multiply together to create this 9 fourths. Well, think about it, guys. In order to get the 9 fourths, we multiplied in a 3 halves times a 3 halves. So in other words, this is going to split up as a 3 halves and a 3 halves. Now, if that doesn't feel comfortable with you, and you're not sure, like, is that really right? Well, definitely a negative 3 halves times a negative 3 halves. Negative times negative is positive. 3 times 3 is 9. 2 times 2 is 4. Yeah, it works. But let's check the outsides and insides to make sure we get that negative 3, because that doesn't feel right. But out here, I'm going to get a negative 3 halves x. In here, I'm going to get a neg another negative 3 halves x. They are like terms, so I can combine them up. And remember, when I combine up fractions by addition or subtraction, I need to have a common denominator. I have the common denominator of 2. So remember, when you have that common denominator, you keep it. Combine those numerators. Negative 3 minus 3 is a negative 6. And a negative 6 divided by 2, in fact, is that negative 3x that I wanted in the middle. So yeah, this really is the right way to factor it. And remember, we looked at factoring and we said, when you see something times itself, when you see identical parentheses, very important that you write it as quantity squared. And you now know why it's so important to write it as quantity squared, because at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the square root here, but when I take the square root here, I've got to take the square root here. I've got to figure out what is it I'm taking the square root of right there. That's why right here, don't forget to add that 9 fourths, because the whole pan balance thing, so I'm going to take this 5 and I'm going to add a 9 fourths. So I just have to remember, okay, once again, what's it take to add fractions? That common denominator. So I'm going to put that 5 over top of a 1, and the common denominator here is going to be a 4. So I'm going to write this, I'm kind of running out of room. I'm going to put this up in this corner over here because things are getting jumbled. But that 5 over 1 plus that 9 fourths, Common denominator being 4, this is already here at 9 fourths. Take that 1 and multiply it by 4, take the 5 and multiply it by 4, and I get a 20. So I get a 29 over 4, and that's what ends up over here, a 29 over 4. So that is what I ended up taking the square root of when I did the square root of this side. Now remember, you know that squaring and square rooting cancel each other out, so this is completely gone over here. I get an x minus 3 halves. And on this side, simplify the radical if you can. Now remember the whole distribute the power. So I can take the square root of the 29, which I cannot think of a number that I can multiply by itself to create a 29. And 29 won't break up into anything useful. It's prime. So 29 is only 29 times 1. That doesn't help. So it's going to stay as a square root of 29 up there on that numerator, but I do know the square root of 4 is 2. And don't forget, that was not already on the page. That's not principal square root. That indicates a plus minus because I took the square root. So I'm going to have a plus minus square root of 29 over 2. But like I keep saying, I don't want an x minus 3 halves. I want just an x. But you know what to do. You know that means let's add that 3 halves here. And let's add that 3 halves here. And when I do that, and that means what I'm going to get is x equals my 3 halves plus or minus square root of 29 over 2. And there's my answer. Please remember, guys, very important that you understand, when you have that plus minus, that indicates that you have two answers, two numbers. 3 halves plus square root of 29 over 2 and 3 halves minus square root of 29 over 2. If you needed to get the decimal value for that, in order to put this on the graph, then what you would do is you take 3 halves, you would add square root of 29, and actually you would take square root of 29 divided by 2. You would add 3 halves to that. You would take a square root of 29 divided by 2, make it negative, and add a 3 halves to that. That would give you the two decimal values for where it crosses the x-axis. But right now, I'm just trying to solve it this is plenty for solving the quadratic. Um, now, a couple of ways that you could express that answer, I do want to point that out to you. One is to do it like this, perfectly fine. I love this kind of an answer. But because these two have the same denominator, some people prefer to express it this way as a 3 
plus or minus square root of 29 over one single two. That's fine as well because these two indicate the same thing because this says 3 plus the square root of 29 divided by 2, 3 minus the square root of 29 divided by 2. The idea is as long as these have the same denominator, then you can combine them up like that if you want to. But if they have different denominators, you cannot do that. Um, so either one of those is perfectly fine. But here's what happens with the method of completing the square. Tell yourself, this is what I want right here. Quantity squared. What's it take to get quantity squared? I have to have identical parentheses. Will this factor into an identical parentheses? If not, get rid of the stuff that won't let you do it. That's what's keeping me from doing it, so get rid of it and then force it by adding to this side whatever you get when you take this coefficient, cut it in half and square it. Whatever you add here, add here, and then it works itself out by kicking back to your square root property. Now, I want to do one last example, again, just to make sure we're comfortable and we see everything that we could possibly see. So, let me, I'm going to erase this um, because I need to keep everything on the other side. I need to flip back and refer to that. So, I'm going to get this out of here. And this is the last example for completing the square. Hopefully this is making sense because of the beauty of just saying, I want that identical parentheses. I want that quantity squared. That really saved my life a few years ago when I discovered that. So my last example looks like this. 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. Hopefully you're noticing right off the bat, oh, big huge difference here. Because the other two examples had nothing in front here had a coefficient of a 1, but this has a coefficient of 2. So what I need to do is still remember, ultimately what I want to happen is this down here, quantity squared. The only way to get quantity squared is to have identical parentheses. That's how I always start um, problems where I have to solve it by completing the square. I always start it this way. And then I look at this and I go, okay, will that factor into that identical parentheses? Definitely not. Because for one thing, this splits up as a 3 and a 1. That's not happening. So I'm definitely going to get rid of that. But in addition, this will not um, factor as an x and an x. It factors as a 2x and an x. So I've got two things that are preventing this from happening. It's the 2 sitting in front, and it's this negative 3 that's sitting in the back. So I need to get rid of both of those. So um, I need to, like I said, do two things. This is where I'm going to roll back to those steps one more time. Remember, one of those steps is to say isolate that constant term. So that um, negative 3 that we saw, that we're going to slide to the other side, definitely get rid of that. But I also need to make sure that the front coefficient here is a 1. Because if the front coefficient is a 1, it's very easy to split up as an x and an x. No big deal. So I need to make sure that I make the coefficient... Of my squared term, boy, I'm really running out of room here. So let's write it up here. Coefficient of that squared term equal to a 1. Get rid of that constant term, make the coefficient of the squared term equal to a 1. And that sets the stage for being able to do the rest and actually do that method of completing the square. So let's kick it back then to um, that, that problem that we were looking at. And we said, okay, two is causing a problem, negative three is causing a problem. It does not matter which order you do this. I know that in my steps I said get rid of the constant first and then make sure the front coefficient's a one. It really doesn't matter which order you do it. Just get them both done. So it's totally up to you which way you go with this. Some people prefer to go through and divide by two on everything and then take this constant term and slide it over. Some people prefer to slide the constant over first and then divide by the front coefficient. It really doesn't matter. It seems like most prefer to go ahead and get rid of this constant term first. I, I, I think most people like that best. So I'm going to do that first. When I do, I get a 2x squared plus 5x equal to a 3. 
But remember, here's my goal right here. I want identical parentheses. This still will not factor into identical parentheses because of that 2 sitting in front. So what I have to do at this point is I have to divide by 2. But remember, what you do, you do to the entire side. Not to an individual term, but to the whole side, divide by 2. And that pan balance idea says, do it to this side, you better do it to this side. So I'm going to divide this side by 2 as well. Now, that cancels. It's great. But this 2 has to divide into both terms here. The whole side gets divided by 2. So I get a 5 halves x right here. And on this side, I get a 3 halves. Now, we're getting kind of scared because we have the fractions, but we can handle fractions. It's okay. It really is okay. So what I'm going to do at this point, remember, is I'm still asking myself, will this factor into identical parentheses? Feels better because I can do an x and an x, but I don't know what's going to go here. So I have to force it by adding something to this side and adding the very same thing to this side. So now I have to figure out what is it that I'm going to add in here. And remember, this is where the completing the square comes into place. I'm going to take that middle coefficient, that 5 halves. I'm going to cut it in half. Now this is where it feels weird because when I go to cut it in half like this, oh my gosh, that's a complex fraction. That is really stressful to me. But what I need to remember, and we, we've talked about this a long time ago, but remember that dividing by a number is the same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal. So dividing by 2 is the exact same thing as multiplying by 1 half. That's going to be cleaner and faster. So instead of doing this, instead I'll take my 5 halves and I'll multiply it by 1 half. It doesn't feel clean, but it definitely is clean. Because remember, whenever you multiply fractions, bam, there it is. That's right, we're still doing our gain symbol. We're going to cancel on the diagonals, we're going to shoot straight across. Now when I look at this diagonal here, nothing cancels. When I look at this diagonal here, nothing cancels. So I'm ready to shoot straight across. Across here I get a 5, and across here I get a 4. That is not quite what I'm going to add to both sides. Because remember, I take my middle coefficient, I cut it in half, and I square it. So I need to square this. Now, remember, distribute the power. So 5 fourths times 5 fourths would mean 5 times 5 is 25. And 4 times 4 is 16. That's what I'm going to add in there. And what I do to one side, I have to do to the other side. So now then, let me clean that up for you. There we go. This is ready to factor. I know it feels heavy because of the fractions, but they really do work themselves out. So remember, back here this tells me same signs. This tells me both pluses. So I'll have a plus here and I'll have a plus here. I want two numbers that will multiply for this and add for this. Hopefully you're noticing something like in the last example. Let me kick back to that last example and point this out to you. Remember that what I added here and here, or no, oh, actually what, when I factored it, what got into this place and this place was once I cut this in half, right before I squared it, it was this number right here. That's what goes in here and here. And if you notice, I, I know I erased it, but in the previous example, once we factored that into a quantity squared, that quantity squared looked like this. Um, an x minus 3 halves and an x minus 3 halves. This 3 halves here came from taking that negative 3, the middle coefficient, cutting it half, right before I squared it. That negative 3 halves is what went in there. So every single time when you're struggling to figure out what goes here and what goes here, trying to figure out what will multiply to be this, well this, I mean if it's a 25 or a 16, 5 fourths is probably it. And if you notice, that's what we had right before we squared it. So it will split up as a 5 fourths and a 5 fourths. Now, when I go to check those outsides and insides to make sure that I really did split it up correctly, that I really am factoring it correctly, out here I'm going to get a 5 fourths x, and here I'm going to get a 5 fourths x. And when I go to check those, 5 fourths x plus another 5 fourths x, Remember, in order to combine those up, to combine fractions, I need common denominators, which I've got. So I'm going to keep that denominator, 
Add up those numerators. 5 plus 5 will give me a 10. Always simplify a fraction if you can. 10 fourths simplifies to 5 halves. Yeah, 5 halves x. So I know, yeah, that really is the way to factor it. And I do have identical parentheses. Aha, that's what I wanted was identical parentheses. So I'm going to write it as quantity squared because now I am ready to take the square root. But remember, when I take the square root of this side, like this, and I take the square root of this side, I've got to figure out what is it I'm taking the square root of over here. Whatever I get when I add these two up. So I'm going to take these two fractions, I'm going to add them up. Once again, the idea of the common denominator. So I'm going to take my 3 halves and my 25 over 16. I'm going to get that common denominator, which will be 16. So I'm going to convert this to 16. This is already there. Feeling good about that. 2 times 8 will give me 16. 3 times 8 will give me a 24. And so now, keep that denominator, add up those numerators, 24 and 25 will give me a 49. That's what's going to go right here. So that means that um, my 49 over 16 is what I'm going to take the square root of, 49 over 16 here. Squaring the square root and cancel each other out. And I'm just left with my x plus 5 fourths. And on this side, Here's the cool thing. I know the fractions are feeling scary. I know they're heavy, but watch what happens here. You know what the square root of 49 is. It's just a 7. You know what the square root of 16 is. It's just a 4. Not bad. But remember, I took the square root. It wasn't already on the page. So that means I need what? Oh, yeah. Plus, minus. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want just x, not x plus 5 fourths. We all know at this point, we're getting good at this now, we're going to subtract that 5 fourths. We're going to subtract that 5 fourths. And so what that gives me now is just the x that I wanted. And then I've got that negative 5 fourths plus or minus 7 fourths. Now, can you take a negative 5 fourths and add a 7 fourths? Yeah, you can do that. You're smart. You can do that. Can you take that negative 5 fourths and subtract the 7 fourths? Yeah, you can do that. You're smart. So let's go ahead and do it because we can go further. See, back on the other one, we were kind of stuck in a way. Back on this one, once we got down to this, that's going to be a nasty decimal. So I don't really want to take that negative 3 and add this irrational number that's going to go on forever and ever and ever, never repeat, never end. I don't want to take the negative 3 and subtract that nasty decimal either. I'm going to keep it exact because as soon as I get that decimal and I round it, I don't have an exact answer anymore. I want to keep things exact. So I'm going to leave it in that radical format. But here, I can go further because I can take that negative 5 fourths and add 7 fourths. I can take that negative 5 fourths and subtract a 7 fourths. So I'm going to go ahead and do it just because I can. I'm smart enough. I can do it. So, when I take my negative 5 fourths and I add 7 fourths, I have the common denominator. I'm going to add those numerators. Negative 5 plus 7 is 2. So I get 2 fourths. Always simplify a fraction if you can. You're going to get your 1 half. And then I'm going to take my negative 5 fourths and I'm going to subtract that 7 fourths. So let's do that on this side. negative 5 fourths, oops, minus 7 fourths. Again, I have the common denominator, so I'm going to keep it. I'm going to combine the numerators. Negative 5 minus 7 is a negative 12. And negative 12 over 4 is just a negative 3. So there's my two answers. X is negative 3. X is 1 half. Those are the two numbers that when I put them here and here and I do all that order of operations, I'm going to come up with a zero. And these are the two spots where this graph is going to cross that x-axis. So hopefully you understand the method of completing the square. And like I said, the big drive behind it is I always put down my quantity squared, my parentheses squared. And I start working backwards and saying, what would it take to have parentheses squared? Identical parentheses. Will this factor into identical parentheses? If not, get rid of the stuff that won't let it happen. Get rid of your constant term. Get rid of your front coefficient if it's not a 1. If it is a 1, you're gold. But if it's not a 1, divide it out. Just remember, you're dividing every single term 
by that, by that front coefficient every term, even this side as well. Once you've done that, you want that identical parentheses, so you have to force it to happen right here. Take that middle coefficient, cut it in half, square it. That's what will be added here and here, and then when you go to factor it, what will go in each of these slots is what you got right before you squared it. And then that will create your quantity squared, and you're just going to take square root of both sides using that square root property. So, hopefully this makes sense. Um, if not, let me know and I can help you through it. And you guys have a great day.